I'm Brianna Keeler, live from CNN's Washington headquarters. Underway right now, Democrats in the House now reacting to a no-show. Committee chairman leading the impeachment inquiry saying they'll issue a subpoena for Ambassador Gordon Sondland. The White House stepped in at the last minute this morning, early this morning, to block Sondland's appearance on Capitol Hill. The U.S. ambassador to the European Union was expected to face questions on his role in President Trump pressuring Ukraine to dig up dirt on Joe Biden in exchange for much needed military aid. Our Manu Raju is on Capitol Hill. And Manu, tell us why Democrats wanted to hear from Sondland. Well, Sondland played a key role in the discussions about setting up a meeting and having discussions after the president had a, President Trump talked to the president of Ukraine, Zelensky, about the president's desire to investigate Joe Biden, to have the Ukrainians investigate Joe Biden. And the, around those ta that conversation that the president had with Zelensky, Sondland engaged in other conversations with individuals about moving forward in, in setting up both a meeting with uh, the Ukrainian government and uh, the president of the United States. States. That meeting had been put on ice. The Ukrainians had raised concerns about that. Also, he was uh, involved in discussions about why that military aid was withheld. He said in one of the text messages with another uh, diplomat that there was no quid pro quo. And then there were all more questions in that text message exchange. The Sunland said, "Call me." He told that to uh, to Bill Taylor, who's a diplomat, who's uh, also of interest here on Capitol Hill. The questions are, well, what happened afterwards? Those are among the questions that Democrats wanted to ask. They also wanted to see these text messages of his own that had not been turned over yet to Capitol Hill. Now, Adam Schiff came out after this was announced that Sunland would not appear and made very clear he views this as obstruction of Congress. We will consider this act today, and we've had members fly in from around the country to hear the ambassador's testimony, uh, as well as the withholding of the ambassador's documents, uh, as well as efforts that may be made to discourage or having the effect of discouraging other State Department witnesses from coming forward and testifying, as they have agreed to, to be further acts of obstruction of a co-equal branch of government. We understand the reason why the State Department decided not to have Ambassador Sondland um, appear today. I mean, you, it's based on the unfair and partisan process that Mr. Schiff has been running. Now, Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, just spoke to reporters in Seattle, and she called this an abuse of power. She said the president is obstructing Congress from getting the facts, but she was asked if it would be part of an article of impeachment about obstructing Congress. She would not go there, said they're not going to prejudge the matter about whether the president will be impeached or what those articles will look like. But clearly, that is a major consideration as the Democrats ask for these witnesses who are not yet coming. Brianna? All right, Manu, thank you. And a source close to the president's impeachment team is telling CNN that blocking Sondland's testimony today was part of a larger strategy, that the days of playing nice, if you thought they were, are over. Caitlin Collins at the White House, tell us what you're hearing. Well, Brianna, we know that late last night, administration officials were discussing whether or not the ambassador should go up to Capitol Hill for this scheduled testimony. And of course, you heard from Republicans there that Manu just pointed out, who said they actually wanted him to come. They wanted to be able to question him about this, but they agreed with the White House strategy in the end. And while the White House hasn't put out an official statement saying why they blocked him from going, we know that we're hearing from behind the scenes sources who say essentially the White House's argument here is they don't see this impeachment inquiry as legitimate. They want Democrats to take that vote before they feel like they have to cooperate more fully, and they don't want to cooperate too much right now before that vote has been taken or a decision has been made on that. And that is really what played a key factor in determining whether or not they should block him from going up to Capitol Hill. Now, of course, this is going to be a fight that continues. And what you're seeing with these threats of these subpoenas, as Manu just laid out, is the White House is saying that they think it's worth the risk of angering these Democrats than it is to have someone go up there and testify, tell them what he knows, because, of course, he is someone who is at the center of all of this. He's the ambassador to the European Union. Ukraine's not even in the European Union, but he's someone who the president directed to to really take the lead on a lot of this. And that is why so many people want to talk to him about those discussions that he's had.
All right, Caitlin Collins at the White House, thank you. And joining us now to discuss Jeffrey Engel, Kylie Atwood, Joseph Marino, Dana Bash, and Gloria Borger with us. And Gloria, you have some reporting. It requires a bit of a setup here. So I just want to say this is about a key text message that Sondland, the ambassador to the EU, would have had to testify about. At one point, Bill Taylor, who's then the senior most U.S. diplomat in Ukraine, texts about how security assistance is being withheld quote, for help with a political campaign. He called it, quote, crazy. Now, Sondland, the ambassador to the EU, replies after several hours with this response, quote, Bill, I believe you are incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The president has been crystal clear, no quid pro quos of any kind. Tell us your new reporting. Well, uh, my reporting is that after he received that text from Taylor, he said, what's going on here? I need to find out called the president, you see there's a gap of about four and a half hours, uh, that he spoke with the president, I'm told, and that the president emphatically told him that there was no quid pro quo, which kind of explains the timeline and also the lawyerly response uh, to Taylor's uh, text. I should also note that the Wall Street Journal has reported this as well. And that um, so it lets you sort of understand a little bit, bit about what was going on in Sunland's mind. He was somebody who wanted to get aid to Ukraine, and here he is, uh, a, a political appointee, hearing this from a professional diplomat, and he's saying, what, really? And then he decided, I'm going to call the president for myself, and that was the answer he got. What do you think about this, Dana? I, I mean, so many things. First of all, uh, just chain of command. Um, the fact that the ambassador to the EU, it sounds like a, okay, sh shoulder shrug, maybe uh, at first blush, that he would just pick up the phone and call the president, but that's normally not how it works. And it kind of shows how hands-on the president of the United States mm -hmm. was on this particular topic and why. Um, second of all, the gap. The fact that there was that gap and that, the, that it was obvious that he wrote that text that we've all seen that you just uh, read again. Uh, deliberately within to, some input from somebody right. that was very clear right maybe a lawyer clear. who knows and, <laughs> exactly. and if you kind of take a step back about it the the question of why did he say that what did he really think what kind of pressure was he getting what other information does he has have those are all the questions the very real questions that democrats and republicans also should have they were going to ask him today and the fact that the state department as caitlin reported uh decided to take the hit the administration decided to take the political hit in um, looking like they have something to hide rather than actually letting him come out and, and, and testify. Uh, maybe they've learned their lesson that transparency has some costs. Well, and I, and, I, I, uh, I and, yeah, no, uh, go ahead. Well, Joseph, you're a former federal prosecutor. So if you were trying to look for some answers here, where would you be going? Well, I mean, we all know how dangerous time gaps can be, right? And, and that, that answer was absolutely lawyerly. I could not have crafted it better myself if I was counseling him as my client. Um, so you want to go to first-hand witnesses, right? I mean, we've seen the transcript. We've seen the whistleblower complaint. But let's go to these individuals who actually know what happened here. And, you know, for, from my perspective, you've seen a radical change in strategy in the, two, in the last two weeks, right? Going from the president saying, you want the whistleblower complaint, here you go. You want the transcript, here you go. To now, that is not going to be what happens going forward. They're exactly. going to circle the wagons. They're going to drag their feet. And they're going to make every single bit of information as hard as possible to get. Kylie, how unusual is it for the State Department to tell an employee like Sondland, hey, you're not cooperating with a congressional investigation? Well, we're sort of in uncharted territory here because this is a, a situation that the State Department hasn't really been faced with. But the reality is that these ambassadors still work for the State Department. Ambassador Sondland, as uh, the statement put out by his lawyer indicated earlier today, he didn't really have a choice when the State Department told him that he could not go and talk to Congress today. But that statement did say that he was profoundly disappointed, that he does want to talk to Congress. Now, the other factor here, however, is the State Department, the legal advisor here, had been in touch with the White House and with Congress up until last night. And we heard from Chairman Schiff this morning that there was no indication in those conversations that Ambassador Sondland was not going to show up. So it really does demonstrate that this was a decision made primarily by the White House here, that the State Department was going back and forth about this testimony and then ultimately 
ultimately when the White House counsel got involved and directed the State Department not to allow Ambassador Sondland to go forth, that's what happened. So the State Department is at the center of all this, but it's really, uh, it appears it's the White House that's calling the shots here. Jeffrey, you're a historian. You are an expert on impeachment. The White House's blanket non-compliance here, historically, how well does that work out for an administration? You know, historically, we've really crossed an important Rubicon. I mean, taking the big picture look, this is something that doesn't typically work out well for any administration and certainly not for a president who's under fire in this way. In fact, two of the three impeachment cases that we have, Andrew Johnson's in the 1860s and Richard Nixon's in the 1970s, really hinged upon the idea that the president was subverting Congress, that Congress, if you will, decide it needed to reassert its authority and that the president was not allowed to become too dominant over its place within the separation of powers. So the obstruction question, the question of whether or not Congress has the right to subpoena, that's actually something that goes directly to the heart of the separation of powers. Historically, that's when Congress has acted. And Republicans, the White House, they have obviously settled on the reality that the House Democrats are moving on this. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, the Democrats are saying, as Adam Schiff said this morning, this is another piece of evidence in our case that we're building on obstruction of Congress, as Jeffrey just said. But that's a case that they're already, that they've already got. So this, we're not going to give them more evidence strategy is acknowledging that reality. Do and they, they need to have any more Repub any Republicans, well, do, any inkling of a Republican? Do they need more evidence for a compelling case? Well, I mean, they would like to get yeah. as much as they can because they would. It's and about it's about potentially pulling some Republicans over who had, could see a broader, more exactly. more deep, more sub substantial case and say, I don't have a choice but to be with the Democrats. Can I just that. add one more thing about Pompeo here, the secretary of state, because, of course, it was the State Department that told him that's right. Pompeo was one of the leaders of the Benghazi investigation, mm -hmm. and now there are clips everywhere about uh, Pompeo talking about how we need to get all the information, we need to get all the documents, we need to get all the facts, we need to have you cooperate. And here he is now telling Somland that, sorry, you can't testify about something you were directly involved Shoot in. Shoot me to other foot. Right. That's right. <laughs> I would agree on building evidence to a limit, though. People, if, look, when the Democrats are talking substance, they're winning. People can understand the use, the abuse of office for political gain. They understand that. That's why the polls are changing. If the Dems are talking process, they're losing. If you're fighting about whistleblower testimony, right. subpoenas and who's showing up and who's not showing up, is this a real impeachment inquiry because it hasn't had a vote, then you're losing ground. So keep your eye on the ball. Stick with the evidence you have. Build a case, but within reason, don't let this run out over a year. In that case, you're, you're, you're basically playing on the president's field at that point, and you're losing ground. I mean, Jeffrey, this is an uphill battle for Democrats, uh, especially with a president who shows uh, no shame and no desire to try to avoid this fight publicly. Well, in fact, I actually might uh, take that point and take it in the opposite direction of some of your, your of our fellow guests, because I, I think that this is actually something that the Congress historically can impeach the president for without further evidence. And I think it might be something that the American people understand. I mean, everybody in third grade understands their civics lessons on the Constitution, that we are set up with three co-equal branches that struggle for power, and that when one branch gets too powerful, the other branches strike back. Historically, the fact that the president would not agree with the Congress is reason enough for the Congress to impeach. Now, that may not be the ideal case for the Democrats, but it's certainly something that we have seen in the past be enough to move the impeachment forward. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Kylie, really appreciate it. Joseph, Dana, and Gloria, thank you all. With the White House once again blocking... The White House ordered Ambassador Gordon Sondland not to testify before Congress today is scheduled. Sondland was intricately involved in negotiations between the U.S. and Ukraine over military aid that President Trump wanted to exchange for getting dirt on Joe Biden. Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton is with us. She is on the House Oversight Committee. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. So you were supposed to be in this committee room hearing the ambassador today. What did you want to hear from him? Well, we were all set to go at 9.30, and only a half hour uh, in advance did we learn that he would not be appearing. He has critical information. Ambassador Sondland was in contact directly with the president. 
in several conversations back and forth. Uh, he has personal emails that we need to ask him about. Uh, so this man, who is, after all, the ambassador to the EU, you must ask yourself, what is he doing in Ukraine? Uh, this is a man who flew to Warsaw <laughs> to meet with President Zelensky. He uh, inserted himself deeply into this matter, uh, and the matter, of course, is withholding information on national security by the president. Uh, made himself a part of it. We need to talk with him. Now we must subpoena him because he has refused to come voluntarily. Um, Congresswoman, I wanted to ask you because one of our experts just made a point that our political analysts agreed with, which is that when Democrats are focused on process, which is some the Trump administration is making this happen to some degree, but this focus on subpoenas, who's not testifying, stonewalling, instead of say what is the narrative, right, of what is in the transcript, that it's not really a compelling argument for swaying the public or Republicans. What do you say to that, and, and what do Democrats need to do to get away from that? First of all, we're not focused very much on process because we already have enough in this inquiry to move forward with impeachment, but we are concerned that we miss no steps. And the reason we are requiring the president to go through all the hoops is so that he will not raise process against us. He knows full well that he himself have confessed, uh, if I may use that word, to what amount to articles of impeachment. But that's not the way the House is going to move. It is going to go step by step. And as you can see, what they are doing is simply piling on with more reasons for articles of impeachment. When do you expect there to be a floor vote on impeachment? Oh, we can't know that because that would be jumping the hoop. We need to go through the steps. Remember, the Congress is not even in session now, and yet we're working. We do want to do this expeditiously. We want to get to the real business of the House of Representatives. Here we've taken the House 10 months ago. We're not even talking about climate change and gun control. And we want to get back to that. And the only way to get back to those critical issues which are responsible for our taking control of the House is to clear away this impeachment matter and move forward when the Congress comes back. House Republicans came out in support of the White House blocking Sondland's testimony. Perhaps no surprise there, but they say that if Democrats release the full transcript from Ukraine envoy Kurt Volker's testimony last week, that they will reconsider. Do you? Th why haven't we seen Volker's uh, full testimony? Well, we're not withholding a transcripts, and I, I have not been informed. I'm one of the. I'm on one of the three committees. I've not been informed about any delay. We certainly have seen transcripts that uh, are, for example, of the whistleblower that are definitive on what the president has done. So uh, I have not been informed, but they, I certainly They say there's inquire. more text messages. Do you think that that would be oh, well, helpful to see? More text messages from the ambassador? Just that Congress was able to see that were in a greater number than what was released publicly. Yeah, there are more text messages, for example, from Ambassador Sondland. We want those text messages mm -hmm. a as well as, as his testimony. And so we will be subpoenaing those text messages uh, as well as subpoenaing him to come before our committee. All right, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. President Trump has made a number of false accusations against Joe Biden and his son Hunter when it comes to Ukraine, and many Republicans have been in lockstep with uh, those. Up next, we have Kate Bedingfield of the Biden campaign joining me to talk about that. She is the deputy campaign manager. So we have some new uh, breaking news right now. We have new details on President Trump's July 25th Ukraine phone call. Sources are telling CNN that in the immediate aftermath of the call, there was a major scramble by national security aides to address potential issues created by this conversation. We have Pamela Brown following these developments. We have Caitlin Collins with us again from the White House. Caitlin, what exactly are we learning here? Well, we're learning just what a scramble this was, Brianna, almost from the minute 
President Trump hung up with the Ukrainian president during that phone call in July that now is at the center of all of this. That included what sources are telling CNN, at least one National Security Council official alerting the White House's national security lawyers about the concerns that were being raised about what it was that President Trump had said to the Ukrainian president. Those are the same lawyers who later ordered that transcript to be moved from where they're typically kept to that highly sensitive server where transcripts were not typically kept in the past. It also included almost immediately officials who were aware of what the president said on the call, asking each other if they needed to alert other senior officials about what had been said, including and mainly focusing on the Justice Department, since the president had brought up the attorney general who was not on the call just so much. And Brianna, a lot of this, what we're learning about the scramble, really just backs up that whistleblower's complaint and exactly what the official was detailing in there. And, and Pamela, this was something they thought they could keep in the executive branch. Yeah, that's right. Uh, sources tell me that this was tightly contained within the White House Counsel's Office and in the NSC. The initial concerns over the phone call, the, um, the lawyer, the administration lawyer who reached out to the White House Counsel lawyer about that initial disclosure, as you'll recall, uh, and even the whistleblower complaint itself. So we were told that essentially the White House lawyers thought that it could be dealt with, managed within the executive branch. But then it became clear about a week before the whistleblower complaint was released in that transcript that that wouldn't hold, that that basically they had lost that battle and that it, it was becoming more and more clear that the complaint would be handed over to Congress. And so then we saw a change in posture uh, in the White House Counsel's Office where then the lawyers reassessed the situation and said, okay, let's actually push this out. Let's ourselves, let's get the transcript out. Um, let's get, you know, and then by, by putting the transcript out, they basically had no choice but to then put the complaint out, I'm told. What changed this whole dynamic uh, in, in the White House counsel's office was the fact that the whistleblower went to DNI, filed the complaint, went through the procedures, the DNI was told um, that he could not hand over the information to Congress, and the IG was seemed to be so upset about this, the IG alerted Congress to, to what was going on. And so that was really what changed everything. This was about a week before the complaint was released, and we're told that that, that was when other people in the West Wing, top officials like the Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, um, Stephanie Grisham, the Press Secretary, and other top officials were then looped in on what exactly was going on with the complaint and the concerns over the call. Pamela, Caitlin, thank you both so much. House Democrats say that they will subpoena U.S. Ambassador to the European Union Gordon Sondland after the White House contacted him early this morning to block his scheduled testimony today. Sondland was pulled into the Ukraine phone call scandal when former U.S. envoy to Ukraine Kurt Volker provided text messages uh, that he had, including with Sondland, to Congress. Impeachment, a huge issue on the 2020 campaign trail, especially for Joe Biden and Kate Bettingfield is joining us now from Philadelphia. She's the deputy campaign manager and communications director for the Biden 2020 campaign. Kate, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Brianna. So the, the president, President Trump, wanted dirt on Joe and Hunter Biden. Trump's claims about wrongdoing here are unsubstantiated. We have looked, lots of out, outlets have looked. But it doesn't smell great to have had the then VP's son on a board of a company in an industry that he really didn't know much about. And it gives this appearance of trading on his name. This is also a vulnerability to a much greater degree for the president's own children. And yet your campaign is really steering clear of that line of attack. Why? Well, look, as you said, every outlet in the world has looked into this and has come back and said that there was no there there. So, you know, we're not going to play Donald Trump's game. We are not going to let him distract from the corruption uh, in his own administration. You know, you saw Vice President Biden come out on Friday and say that Donald Trump is overseeing one of the most corrupt administrations in modern American history. This is his playbook. We know that. But we also know that the whataboutism and the false equivalency uh, isn't going to work. We're not going to let him do it. So, you know, what we saw, for example, over the weekend, we saw a headline pop that when Rudy Giuliani was in Ukraine trying to fabricate, create this dirt on Joe Biden, he was also simultaneously trying to make a buck off of Ukrainian national gas contracts. Now, who was surprised by that? I know we were all shocked, shocked to learn that there's gambling going on in this establishment. So, look, we are not going to let the, them turn the conversation away from the corruption and the uh, malfeasance that is impacting uh, uh, voters' daily lives. And so we're going to be very tough about that. 
but we're simultaneously, we're going to remind people why Donald Trump is doing this, and it's because he fears Joe Biden. There's one Democrat in this race that he doesn't want to have to face at the ballot box, and it's Joe there, Biden. So there we're, are, we're not going to let him be successful at playing this game. There are reportedly Democrats who are concerned um, that it's been too long, that the campaign waited too long to really vociferously confront this. What do you say to them? I would say that Biden has been out and the campaign has been out aggressively every day since this broke. I mean, you've had Joe Biden uh, give numerous speeches on the magnitude uh, of this threat to the American people, of what Donald Trump is doing to shred the Constitution. You've had him take multiple questions from reporters. We have uh, multiple ads out on air now. Uh, you also saw him at an op-ed. You had an op-ed in the Washington Post on Sunday where he talked about the fact that Donald Trump is putting his personal political interests ahead of the national security of the United States and that that is hurting people's daily uh, people in their daily lives. So he, we've had absolutely uh, no issue coming out and being aggressive uh, against Donald Trump. But I think the most important thing is, you know, when you say Democrats are concerned, I mean, what I see in these stories are pundits and strategists. What I don't see are voters, because if you look, if you ask the voters, what you get uh, is the Wisconsin poll from this week, where uh, Donald, where uh, Joe Biden's beating Donald Trump by nine points. You get the well, South Carolina poll, where he's leading by I, 29 points. I want to ask so you about think, that because think, you you do have a new ad that is capitalizing on that. It's running digitally uh, or on television in four early states, and you're emphasizing Trump's focus on Biden as you emphasize Biden's poll numbers. Let's take a look. I don't care about Biden's campaign. <laughs> I don't care about Biden's campaign. Joe Biden. 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 So I will say your whole point here, especially as then you show the poll numbers where Biden is doing better, is you're inviting voters to join a campaign that can beat President Trump. Um, I will tell you this sort of focus on Trump being obsessed with Biden. I mean, Trump was obsessed with Hillary Clinton, too, including after he beat her. He doesn't want to face Joe Biden. It's unprecedented for uh, an incumbent president to be facing a 10-point deficit against a potential, uh, a potential rival, and that's Joe Biden. And you've got now you have Trump and the RNC pouring money uh, into a Democratic primary uh, because he doesn't want to have to face Biden and he wants to get to pick his opponent. So I think in a, at a time when Democratic voters say the number one thing that they want in a nominee is somebody who can beat Donald Trump, if you ask Donald Trump who he thinks is going to beat him, it's very clear it's Joe Biden. And so I think you're going to continue to see that uh, argument from our campaign. Uh, you know, uh, you saw the ad there. And certainly if you look at the polling, I mean, morning consult uh, just this morning, Biden's up 33 percent in the early states, up plus one, because people like the argument he's making. They know that he's taking a strong moral case to Donald Trump, and they know that he's the guy who can beat him. And part of the reason they know that is because Donald Trump is telling them that Joe Biden is the person who can beat him. So that is something that you're going to continue to see from our campaign. Trump, uh, he's also, Biden, rolling out a new education policy, and this includes a plan to provide two years free community college or vocational training. It would increase Pell Grants up to 200 uh, percent for low-income Americans. There's money in there for historically black colleges and universities. This would reduce loan debt, especially for people who go into public service professions. But then you have, to the vice president's left, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, who are promising even more here. So what do you say to voters who might be enticed by their more generous plans of free college? Well, look, as Vice President Biden and Dr. Biden, who is a community college professor, sat down to think about how they wanted to map out an education plan, the most important thing to them was making sure that the largest number of people have access to a middle class life. And yes, a four year college education is an important piece of that, but so is access to community college, so is access to high quality training programs. So as they were thinking about how can we have the broadest impact on the largest number of people's lives in this country, that was the guiding philosophy as they thought about how to put this plan together. Uh, so I think what we have here is a plan that also, it also includes a historically large investment in HBCUs and minority-serving institutions. Um, so what you have here is, I think, a plan that is 
as ambitious as any plan in this race, but for the broadest number of people. I think this plan will have the most impact on real people's lives. Uh, and that was the driving philosophy behind uh, Vice President Biden and Dr. Biden's thinking as they were thinking about how can we put forward a plan that is progressive, that is achievable, and that will do the most real good in the most people's lives. And so that's what this plan is all about. And it, as you listed at the top, uh, it doubles value, it doubles um, uh, Pell Grant values. It uh, caps student loan repayment at 5% of your discretionary income to help ensure that people don't have this tremendous burden uh, of student loans that they currently have. And it targets that relief at the people who need it most. And that's another important piece of this plan is that it, it really provides um, that relief and help for the people in our country who need it the most. So that's that's